Good morning, Mr. Thompson. Uh, good morning, Chief Justice Marshall, members of the court. Uh, may it please the court, uh, this is the case of uh, Commonwealth versus Stewart. Involves a fundamental principle of criminal procedure, which is that a, a lawyer cannot cross-examine a witness who has not been sworn. The right of confrontation under the state and federal constitutions is defeated when a witness who has not been sworn is allowed to testify. And that's what occurred in this case. I think that the handling of the witness, Robert Hoag, is the key issue in this case. Hoag was allowed to testify without being sworn. He could not be cross-examined. <clears throat> The could testimony just, that he gave was not harmless beyond a reasonable doubt. Can I just ask you about the he could not be cross-examined part? Yes, um, Justice Botson. The, um, at the conclusion of his, quote, testimony, yes. um, the, the defendant, uh, the judge turned to the defense counsel, and the defense counsel said, I believe, no questions. Yes. Um, you think that's a, I, I, I mean, how does... Should we take that as, I can't do this? I mean, I, in other words, did the defendant have to do, defense counsel need to do something to sort of say, I cannot cross-examine? In other words, the, the, no questions may mean, I don't have any questions. It could be, but I think that it's clear uh, before the witness was put on the witness stand that the defense counsel raised the issue of confrontation. Certainly did, certainly did. And that, and I, and I think that, that so really only means one thing, that. since the witness was there on the witness stand, obviously he was present, which is the first uh, requirement for, cross for confrontation and cross-examination. But as a point of fact, he couldn't be cross-examined. He was, uh, the presentation involved a... Um, he had taken the Fifth Amendment. He, he yeah. had taken the Fifth Amendment, but the, judge, the trial judge... No, no, I understand. I mean, of course you can't cross-examine somebody who's taken the Fifth no, Amendment. No, but the, the, the judge had found that he didn't have a valid Fifth Amendment privilege to... Well, to that, that, yeah. had, that finding had been made, although I think that that finding was unfounded. Uh, the he first question the witness was asked was, did you commit the murder uh, that's at issue here? Obviously, he, he had a privilege. he said no. He answered the question. Is that a waiver? No, I, I don't think it is a waiver because he'd already been told by the judge that he didn't have a privilege against self-incrimination. Uh, I think that uh, his lawyer may have fallen short. His lawyer was present with him. His lawyer didn't intervene. Uh, but this goes back to the, machina the machinations that, hit were, that, that occurred that were designed to try to get, find some way to get this information in front of the jury. Uh, it was a problem witness. Uh, it was an important witness. What was the importance of his testimony? We're talking about Hoag, right? Uh, yeah, okay. Hoag's testimony, first of all, uh, purported to relate a confession by the defendant to Hoag. The confession, the, the statements that Hoag made to the police and his grand jury testimony, if believed, what provided it was a roadmap to the yeah, Commonwealth case. This testify. was the theory he, of the case. But he, all that came in through questions, not through answers. And the judge That's, instructed that the questions are not testimony. That, I don't think that that is uh, clear, Justice Cowan. He, his responses to the key questions, I've laid out I, I, in my reply brief, I laid out about two dozen questions. His response to most of the questions was no comment. Um, that's ambiguous, but that's not refusing to testify. Uh, and it is not, the, and it takes the testimony out of the curative range, any curative range of the judge's instructions. The judge's instructions weren't quite, quite correct because the principle that the judge was trying to convey was, or the principle that's involved anyway, is that the questions alone are not answers. And when the question is denied, when a leading question is answered no, obviously the leading question is not evidence. But it's not, the instruction didn't uh, address what actually occurred, which is, the leading questions were not denied. The answer was no comment. Very ambiguous, but could easily have been taken to say, in effect, I don't wish to admit this, but I can't deny it. 
Uh, and so I think that this is very much like the case. As a matter of fact, when I first read the transcript of, of Mr. Hogue's testimony, I thought the prosecutor must have read Douglas versus Alabama, <coughs> but not all the way through to the holding. Uh, this is so similar to the Douglas case, uh, it, uh, it uh, is a uh, surprise that it, would, that it would still occur 40-some 40, uh, 40 years after uh, that ruling by the Supreme Court. Now, why was he shackled? He was shackled because the judge thought that it would have a coercive effect on him. Well, did the judge say that? or that's He true? said that. He did? He said that. At page 412 of the transcript, the judge said, the first time we had him in here, he, was, he came in without shackles. Remember, he's serving a first-degree murder sentence, life without parole, and he's already let the court know that he doesn't intend to testify, and they're concerned with the fact that they don't really have any coercive power over him as a practical matter. So he, the first time he was in front of the court, he refused to testify, and he refused to be sworn. And the judge said, when we bring him in the next time, He's going to be in shackles. And was and he so shackled to the chair, or was he shackled just to himself? The record doesn't show exactly what the shackles were, uh, but if the court will forgive me for relaying personal experience, my expectation is that coming from a maximum security prison through the Department of Corrections transportation system, he, was, he wore a waist chain, a handcuffs uh, chained to the waist chain, and ankle shackles. Could you explain to me, Mr. Thompson, maybe you're not the person I should ask, why that is going to coerce a witness to testify? I think that it was... Uh, I mean, I, it might convey something to the jury, but, I mean, if I'm not going to testify and somebody puts me in handcuffs, why am I going to testify? I think that it had... Um, I, I think that... I, I'm not sure what effect it had on the witness. No, no I'm not asking But I think you, that uh, was the judge's intention, that it would be coercive. I, I, I've heard you say that, and I saw that, and I'm thinking... If somebody doesn't want to testify, I can't imagine why putting somebody in handcuffs, somebody who's transported, e e is trans certainly transported in, in tight security, under tight security, why would that make the witness testify? I am assuming that when he was unshackled, the, the judge thought that, that the witness felt like he had some, um, some say in the matter. Uh, he invoked, he, first of all, he refused to testify. He, after he'd been told he didn't have a Fifth Amendment privilege, and he refused to be sworn. He was defiant to a degree. When he came in, sh in, in shackles the second time, he was less defiant. He still refused to be sworn, but he did take the witness stand, and he did give some testimony. And there was no, uh, with respect to the refusal to be sworn, because that's all the transcript says, witness refused to be sworn. Yes. Did, so we don't know whether what questions were put to him? I mean, was it just, do you swear, or we don't, we don't know anything about exactly that, that uh, interchange. Is that right? I, I think that's right, Justice Botsford. I, I guess that the, that the oath is so routine that the stenographer assumed that everybody knows right. what the clerk says when the witness stands and... and uh, right, it's just that the statute has alternatives, and I just didn't know whether any alternatives were laid out there was a discussion of alternatives with, among the lawyers and the judge. Uh, the prosecutor suggested that the, that the, uh, that the statute will, would allow the witness to affirm, but of course it wasn't a conscientious objection to taking an oath that, uh, that, the, defendant w uh, that the witness was asserting. It was a refusal to be sworn. Uh, so yeah, he didn't say, I refuse to be sworn, but he did not respond to the oath. And so I think it's clear that he was not under oath. Right. I, I'm, not, I'm not questioning that. And so in addition to not being under oath, he did not affirm that these statements that were attributed to him were his. He never said, as in, as in the Douglas case, another reason why he couldn't be cross-examined. But in, and then also, just practically speaking, looking at mm -hmm. the circumstances, he had not been asked what Stewart said to him. He had been asked what he said to the Trooper Mason and what he said to the grand jury, or whether he had said these things, and his response was no comment. So there really wasn't anything to question him about, uh, except to explore the ambiguities of what no comment might, might mean, which wouldn't go to the uh, substance of what was being conveyed to the jury. So even if 
uh, although I think Crawford is conclusive on this, this was testimonial information. Even if you were to say this wasn't actually testimony, it was the kind of presentation that the Supreme Court has categorically ruled out in Douglas and Crawford. I mean, I take it that your argument, assume for the minute that the no comment, that it, 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 you treat it as questions. It is so overwhelmingly specific. It is the only information presented, even in the form of questions, in terms of the actual, I think, uh, how the killing took place. Yes. Um, that it, it's incredibly prejudicial, no matter how the jury heard it. It is not only the only description of the killing that was presented, but it's also very graphic, including a, a description of the victim's response to being stabbed and so forth. It, it, there's no question that this must have had a dramatic impact on the jury, on the jury's view of the case. And it also had a sort of a, um, an organizing uh, effect on the other testimony. That is, this was the Commonwealth's theory. If you take the transcript of the prosecutor's opening statement and lay it next to the questioning of Mr. Hogue, there is a very close match to what the prosecutor promised or offered that was going to be proved and what was attributed to Mr. Hogue. Now, there was some difference. For example, the prosecutor said that there was going to be a statement that this was, hit, that this was Mr. Stewart's first murder, that this was the first murder he ever committed. That did not come out in the testimony. That only was, was only found in the opening statement. But there were only two other witnesses <laughs> who directly incriminated Mr. Stewart, really, and that was Mr. Berryman with his account of, um, excuse me, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Blanchett with his account of what his father had, had uh, supposedly told him, which was simply that he had murdered a woman on the Cape uh, some time ago. Uh, it was very vague, uh, very general, and, and Mr. Tracy, Again, uh, saying that at, at around the time of the murder, uh, Mr. Stewart was working for him and had said uh, first on one occasion that Richie uh, might have a job for him to do some man's old lady, I think it was something like that. And then later, when he was, uh, at, when he was asked where he had been, he said, I had some things to do and I did them. Not, not strong testimony, nothing of the quality of a confession from the defendant laying out the details of how the house was, of where the murder occurred, how the house was entered, how the actual killing was carried out, and, uh, and for added um, uh, emphasis, uh, a very callous attitude toward it. Uh, that was uh, just the fact that it was a confession. I think the Fulminante case makes it very clear that when, that, that there's, there really is no way to expect a jury to listen to a confession, especially having it run through twice, and then be able to respond uh, conscientiously to an instruction to ignore it. But of course, there was no instruction on that point. Uh, they were not told to ignore it. Well, they, so, they were told generally that questions put to witnesses aren't evidence, correct? They were told that, and, the, and that was the point and made in the closing actually, argument, too. Right after the... Um Right after Mr. Hogue finished, wasn't yes. it? And then again in the closing, in the instructions. That's right, Judge. And, and of course, um, that is not an effective corrective. But even, but I think uh, the, the cases like Bruton and I think the, the uh, Macaulay case that I cited from the appeals court make it clear that this is the kind of information that can't be sanitized uh, by a corrective instruction, especially not a corrective instruction that isn't directly on the mark. I mean, if the judge had said, you heard what Mr. Hogue, you heard this exchange between Mr. Hogue and the prosecutor, and I'm telling you, you cannot consider anything that passed between them. It's stricken from the record, and it's not to have any role in your uh, deliberations. I would still argue that that, there was, that, that does not uh, render the error harmless considering the nature of the, the, the fact that it was a confession, the fact that it was singular in the Commonwealth's evidence, 
and the fact that uh, there had been no opportunity for cross-examination. Uh, am I correct that there was no motion for a mistrial? I think you're, you are correct, Justice Gantz, that, that there was not a motion for a mistrial. Uh, however, I think that it's also clear that the, uh, that, the, that the defense counsel was very conscientious in making all the objections that could be made uh, <clears throat> and fought valiantly before this happened as this was developing. This was not an accidental occurrence. This was a uh, strategy that, that, it, that um, developed over a couple of days as the prosecutor and the, and the judge tried to work out a way to get this information in front of the jury. Now, I, I assume you'd be in a different posture if he indeed had been sworn and if he had denied saying what he said before the grand jury or he said he couldn't remember what he said before the grand jury. Do you agree that that would be a very different posture for you? I do. I, I think that if he'd been sworn, the case would be much different. I think there still would be a problem uh, under um, the Benoit case or the Benoit doctrine, that is, the idea of putting, on, uh, putting a witness on for the sole purpose of impeaching them. Uh, particularly here where it but it's not just impeaching right I mean it could I mean if, if that had happened as Justice Gant said it could come in as substantive evidence it could at that point but it was here there was that foundation was not right was I'm not, not late I'm not I mean um, that didn't happen right. yeah. I'm wondering uh, whether you might turn to the the hearsay statements the joint venture hearsay statements yes the the joint the joint venture hearsay statements that were particularly uh, problematic, I think, are Mr. Berryman's uh, account of Mr. Finney's, of his, of his telephone conversation with Mr. Finney, uh, where Mr. Finney said, and, and of course this, uh, the way this, uh, this particular evidence was corroborated by the Hogue uh, information. Uh, Berryman testified that on January 3rd, he had a, of 1980, he had a conversation with Mr. Finney. Is, he, is, is it your claim that if there's evidence linking Mr. Carrier to, um, I'm just blocking on the, uh, Grabowski, Grabowski, Grabowski yes. and there's evidence linking Grabowski to the defendant, yes. and there's evidence linking Finney to Carrier, and is it, was it Finney that was on the phone? Yeah, yes, yeah. it was Finney that um, was on the phone. Th that you have to be able to link Stewart to each one of those people? I mean, in other words, you couldn't have a joint venture where all the links, it's a sort of progressive link, but they may not, all, you may not have evidence that each of them knows that the other is in it. It's sort of a daisy chain uh, yeah. joint yeah. venture. Yeah. I, th I think... Uh, what is required is, is that there be a joint, there, that there be independent evidence of a joint venture relationship between the defendant and the declarant at the time that the statement is made. So you uh, think in this that case, in answer to Justice Botsman's question, you're saying yes, you think that there must be evidence that the de defendant was linked to, at least <coughs> that the defendant was linked to all the people. It isn't enough, you say, that all the people are linked together somehow. You That's right. I think to, uh, when you're talking about the statement that, that, the, that the declarant has to be linked to the defendant, I think that's, that's the way I read, um, all of a sudden the name of the case that I cited is escaping me. Oh, Solanskis. Solanskis, yes, uh, and Cruz, uh, which Solanskis relies on. But I think that, and I think there are two points to be made about this. Number one, the, I believe that the only evidence that linked Carrier to Grabowski was Hogue's testimony and, the, and nothing else. Um, uh, now, Carrier had, been, Carrier had been quoted as having a couple of months yeah, earlier because, tried because, to solicit right. some other people to right. kill his wife. Right. But there's no other evidence linking Carrier to Grabowski except what Hogue said. Which well, well there's, 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 there's the, uh, Mr. Mello's testimony that places Grabowski at the scene at the very time. So that's one true. could infer that. That's true, but but well, it doesn't connect him to Miss. There's nothing that connects him to Mr. Carrier. It's Mr. Carrier's wife, of course. Right, but the combination yeah. of Grabowski saying, "I want you to help me do 
someone's wife and then him being there and then the wife is killed during that time period arguably by inference connects Carrier to Grabowski, wouldn't it? It does connect, it could connect Carrier to Grabowski in that attenuated sense, but we have to connect Finney to this right. somehow. Well, see, and the only evidence that Finney was involved is the testimony of his telephone call. Well, I guess it's, it's, to me it seems that that telephone call is in two parts. His, his prediction of what's going to happen would not seem to be for the truth of the matter, is it? I mean, he's saying it's going to happen today. It seems that, that what's submissible is, what, is the fact that he said it, not that it's for the truth of the matter, because it hadn't even happened yet. Well, it ha it, as far as we can tell, it hadn't happened, but it wasn't limited in that way. That is, it, it came in generally as an admission by a, a co-venturer. So it came in. So. It came in for that purpose. It, ca it came in as a joint venture statement. It came. Well, it, it came in. It just came in. Uh, there was no objection to it, so it came oh. in. Okay. But it, it seems to me that the only the only just the only non-hearsay purpose is as an admission. Uh, as a vicarious ad admission of a co-venturer. Co he did, uh, Finney was not otherwise connected to this at all. And of course it wasn't in the, it, it's not a statement that was in furtherance right. of the, of the uh, joint venture. It couldn't have assisted the joint venture at all. It was a disclosure to a non-participant who was known to be, who was fond of the victim. And one of the un interesting unanswered questions in this case is why if Berryman knew all this, why he didn't call Mrs. Carrier up and say, you're in grave danger. And, he, and instead, 25 years later, he's testifying that he knew this. Uh, there's one final thing on the joint venture uh, issue that I think is very important. Short. Very short. The instruction was deficient. It did not tell the jury that it could only consider those statements if it found that they were in furtherance of the joint venture. And since there were statements that were proffered that were dubious, that is, that had to have a judgment made about whether they fell within that the jury needed that instruction to make, to do its job correctly. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Mr. Shack. Good morning, Madam Chief Justice and other justices of the Supreme Judicial Court. Um, I'm accompanied today by Robert Moriarty, an assistant district attorney in our office. Uh, Your Honors, the the, fact, the facts in this case with regard to the testimony of Mr. Hogue um, are, are, are certainly well um, documented by the transcript inasmuch as the trial judge in this case made the determination at the time Hogue uh, was attempting to, um, to avail himself of Fifth Amendment rights. Um, the, the trial court appointed him an attorney to advise him and to discuss with him whether or not he had that opportunity. And I would suggest to you that um, that's in fact what happened. Attorney Mello was appointed. He, he advised the, uh, um, the well, witness. Right. Yes, but, but, but then what? Well, and then he was, he was counseled by Mr. Mello apparently, and, and Mr. Mello um, shared with the court that he was in fact no, not. No, I'll, 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 I'll accept all, that he no. doesn't have a valid Fifth Amendment privilege, but then what happened seems it still raises a fair number of issues. Well, yes, Your Honor. And Justice Botsford, I would say to you that uh, in, in that circumstance, the issue of, the, um, of whether or not he, he was sworn or whether he was under oath at that time certainly is an issue. But I would suggest to you that an oath in this circumstance may very well have had no effect on him whatsoever, just as, just as in the same circumstance, he refused to take the oath. There was nothing the trial court could do at that point uh, and the trial court was clear with, with the attorneys in the matter that at that point there was, there was simply nothing the court could do. This was a man who was serving a life sentence apparently, um, and again that's based upon the transcript, and that, that, that the court really, I mean, short of, short of simply uh, treating him as an unavailable witness had no choice. The Commonwealth was, was certainly well within its rights at that time, and the, and the assistant district attorney was well within his rights. Um, it seems to me, um, Mr. Shack, you may well be correct about all of that, but, the, the, but, but, but we look at it from the other end of the telescope. We have to look at it from the other end of the telescope. Uh, you know, think of any, wh what does it do to the defendant's rights? Because the state, so I'm including the judicial branch and the executive branch and everybody else, can't get somebody to talk. Well, 
What do you do? Yes, Chief Justice. I they, mean, normally it, you get them to talk by saying, I'm going to hold you in contempt, I'm going to imprison you. You know, those are the normal mechanisms. You don't have those. We don't do torture. So what do you do? It, it doesn't mean to say we set aside all of the constitutional protections for the defendant. Well, I would suggest to you, until he actually takes the stand and says that or doesn't say something, um, you know, the, the, the Commonwealth still should be given the opportunity to, to call its witness. After all, they have a good, he had a good faith basis for calling the witness based upon no, the fact... That, that, that's not in question. The yes. question is, in, how does one protect the defendant's constitutional rights in those circumstances? Well, once again, Chief Justice, he was available. Once, once the first question was asked by the prosecutor and he answered it, he became available for purposes of that testimony. And, and through the questioning, and even, in the, even during the questions um, involving the police report and the, uh, the, the grand jury transcript, at the conclusion of that, there were other questions that he, that he did answer by not saying no comment. But, I mean, but, but none he wasn't of that sworn. Deals with the sworn part. Well, yes, I, I understand that. But once again, I would suggest to you that, that based upon the fact that he was, uh, he was aware he was certainly aware, based upon the communication that he had with his attorney concerning his Fifth Amendment right, <laughs> and also Sheck, if, the if communication it, that occurred with the, ju with, the, the, with the trial judge, of the import of what it was that he was undertaking. Mr. Sheck, in circumstances like this, why doesn't the Commonwealth say to the judge, Judge, I want a very specific instruction, very specific, Judge. I want this jury to have no question that they can sort it through, um, you know, so on and so forth. I mean, then it makes it, 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 it may not take care of all the problems. But here you have the sort of general, you know, questions and you've got the no comment and he hasn't been sworn and I mean what is the jury and, thinking? And then and and then I would say, Chief Justice, also at the conclusion of that testimony, and I'll and I'm trying to answer that question, at the conclusion of his te of his testimony, the defense counsel made the choice not to examine no, well, him. Now, I know, well, I know we're not going back to, and I apologize, Chief Justice, I know we're not going back to the oath issue. I would suggest to you that, that the oath does not need to be present if the defendant, or sorry, if the witness in the case understands the import with, with which he's, he's speaking. And I would also say that... But how do we, we authority authority what that? makes that suggestion? He's locked up for life. He obviously can care less about the system. Exactly, Judge. And so he doesn't understand about the import of an oath. He's, he's for whatever reason, he's He's acting the way he's acting. Mm -hmm. The question is, of course the Commonwealth has a right to call any witnesses, but if a witness doesn't speak, <coughs> right? Yes, Judge, but he did speak. And, and, and I would suggest to you that if you, if in reading the transcript, if you look at the, at the, at the prior day's um, issue when the Fifth Amendment issue was raised, the, the, a message was sent by that witness to the court through his attorney, and that message was, uh, basically, what does no comment mean? No, no comment means no comment. It doesn't mean I'm, a, I'm no affirming comment, the. What does no comment mean? I, 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 I is think it an answer or not an answer? I, I think it's an answer. It's, it's certainly no, an answer to what, the question. Is it yes or no? It, it's not a yes or a no, Judge, but it's certainly an answer to the question. It's, I, I think it's. No, it's, it, so if the instruction is. If, if, the question isn't evidence, right? Yes, Judge. So I ask you a question. Is today Friday? Yes, Your Honor. Well, that's an answer. If you say, if you say nothing. That's not say, an answer. If I no, say no. nothing, that's not an answer. Right. If you say no. That's an answer. No comment. That's an answer as well. And from the jury's point of view, can they accept that it is or isn't Friday? I think with an issue of, of no, whether no, no. or not. What's the answer to that? I, I think with, an issue, with the issue of whether or not it's Friday, they can answer that question. They can answer that question for themselves. Because no, 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 no. Forget that I, they can I, I answer understand. themselves. They don't know what day it is, right? And yes. so you've got a you've got an, a silence. That's no answer, and the judge says disregard the question. You've got a no. You've got a yes. I'm now asking the jury to accept a statement, a question, a statement from the prosecutor, <coughs> as substantive evidence. What does no comment mean in that circumstance? I, I think in that circumstance, under, that, that would be um, tantamount to no answer in, in terms of the specific question that's asked. But it's tantamount to no answer, but there was no instruction given to the jury that said the following. You, to, you know, questions are not evidence. If there was no answer, you absolutely disregard the question. And if the witness said no comment, that's tantamount 
to no answer, so you disregard all those questions too? Well, I think the instruction that was given by the court right after this uh, occurred, indicating that, you know, that, that, no, but it took that the questions a, it are took not me, evidence. It took you and me a while to figure out that no comment is tantamount to no answer. What is there in this record that suggests that this jury understood that they, they were to disregard every single question to which the answer was no comment? Well, I don't think that they, I, again, I don't think that the specific instruction need be made at that point. I think that the, the no, general instruction. No, my answer was what is there in the record that suggests that the jury disregarded every question to which the answer was no comment? I think, again, uh, Your Honor, with all due respect, it's the, it's the issue of the instruction that happens with, in which they're told that questions are not, are, are not evidence and only answers are evidence. And in that case, they can, treat that, they can treat that answer as they like, the no comment answer as they like. They can find it to be no answer. They can find it to be um, whatever they choose. If that's, I mean, that is their. And, and they could choose to no comment as, uh, as we know from reading the newspaper or anything else, often means I agree with that, but I'm not going to say so. Well, we would hope that the jury, again, based upon an instruction, uh, would, would, ex would extrapolate basically that, that in fact it is no answer. I don't think. Uh, and the common's position is not that there has to be a specific instruction with regard to that situation. Would it not have helped? Would it not have helped this case if the Commonwealth had asked for that instruction so that it was clear? Well, I think that uh, I think that uh, in hindsight it's possible, but I do think that based upon the fact that that the assistant district attorney in this um, in this in the effort prior to this questioning, he it was clear that he was aware of of the the type of testimony that he was trying to. Uh, elicit. It was also clear, um, Your Honor, that that he um, attempted at sidebar with defense counsel and the trial court to get to the bottom of what it is that, that could happen here. At Mr. one Shek, point, can I just ask you another question? Of course. It, it appears to be the case, although I'm not sure why, that the that the judge was attempting to coerce the witness to testify. What do we do? <laughs> when the evidence is a judge is trying to coerce a witness to testify? Well, I think that, um, I, I think that the- I mean, is that what we want judges I, to do? Well, Your Honor, respectfully, I disagree with the conclusion that he was trying to coerce him to testify. And I think if, if Your Honor means by, by virtue of the fact that he was brought in in shackles, he, the, you know, and that that was one of the efforts at accomplishing that, I would suggest to you that there's a security reason why-, why Was that the reason that was well, given? Well, there was not a stated reason on the record. The, the judge did say, however, that I'm not going to do that again. I should have had him in shackles yesterday, and I'm not going to do that again. What now, that certainly could have been was, he was aware of the hostile nature of the-, yeah, just, of the just remind me what the jury was told about the shackles. I, I, I don't recall specifically with regard to the, um, to the, to the transcript. Why um, was Hoeg a hostile witness? Why, why does the Commonwealth justify that? Well, in that in the situation, I think the the, the court justified it, in as much as uh, the assistant district attorney asked before the questioning began, based upon the other interaction that had happened. With I know, I know, I know the, what happened, but I'm asking you, how do you justify him being considered a hostile witness? Well, he had he he, he had refused to answer questions before the. That, uh, does that make him a hostile witness? I under think the under definition? the circumstances, and I think under the circumstances. What's the definition of a hostile witness? Well, Your Honor, with regard to this particular instance, with him uh, again, failing to failing to address the the, the court and falling, failing to follow the orders of the court, created his created a, a hostile situation. Mr. And, I'm sorry, finish. No, I just I would say that that is a that that is a hostile situation in this particular case, and that that's what the trial court that's where the trial court apparently made the decision. Can I just go back to the to the coercion point? At the, the day before, um, had Mr. Hoag presented any security list, or he just wouldn't testify? Uh, I, I'm sorry, Chief Justice. Would you repeat that? Um, you said you, the, the judge said I'm not going to go through this again. The day before, had it been a security concern, namely that he jumped up or went to somebody, or or was that he just didn't answer questions? No, I think that the, I think it. I, I think that the reference, and it's not specific in the in the transcript, but I think the reference is to his general demeanor 
And I don't think that this was, again, I don't think this had anything, based upon the record, there's nothing to indicate that this had anything to do with the fact that he simply wasn't answering questions. He hadn't refused to be sworn, for instance, at that point. It, this was after, I mean, he, was, he refused to be sworn after that you, time. You, I mean, it's not very often that we have witnesses testifying in shackles, Kuwait. It is very unusual, Your Honor. So, I mean, I, you know, since the Chicago 7, I can't remember when we last did it, but, um, well, those are the defendants. Um, I mean, so you would have to have pretty compelling reasons, wouldn't you? Well, I think that uh, one, uh, certainly, I think compelling reasons would be those and security reasons, which is that you have, a, was, you have you a murderer. Point, you haven't pointed to anything that said on the day before that any of his conduct gave rise to, to, to security concerns. Well, I, I, again, I, I don't think there's anything in the record that specifically says it's a security concern. I think that, I, uh, again, based upon the response the next day, um, or the, not the response, the statement by the trial court on the next day that, you know, that I'm not going to do that again. I mean, in other words, it, 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 we're not going to do that again. I don't think that that's, again, imparting a sense that I'm going to teach him a lesson about not testifying before me. It, I think, it, I think it, it augurs more towards the side of saying, you know. But it, don't we have the transcript of the day before? Yes. We, there so is they would, there would surely be something in the transcript, you know, wit, you know witness jumps up, witness attacks no, counsel, I, I, witness... No, I don't believe I don't believe Chief Justice that that was the case at all. I think that this was a again the 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 judge's responsibilities to provide security for his courtroom. When witnesses are brought in from Walpole to testify, my memory is that they've been in shackles because they're doing life sentences, and if they do something in the courtroom, there's nothing to do to punish them. I mean, I, I recall seeing witnesses and, in and, shackles. And Chief Justice Cowan, that is the Commonwealth's argument with regard to this issue. Life Let me ask you a question on another subject, if I may, though. Um, how do you justify each of the statements that the defendant is contesting as part of the joint venture? Well, for instance, the phone call to Finney, um, each of the statements, what makes them part of the joint venture? I think the joint venture, I think in examining the joint venture, and the Commonwealth's argument would be that examining the, the, the joint venture, you would start with the, the admission of the defendant that he in fact committed this crime. Uh, and that admission you know, starts with Timothy Blanchett, his son. Uh, who again he came in contact with after okay, you know so he 18 years. Okay, so committed the crime. How does it make a joint venture with all these different people? But then working its way backwards and showing um, not only, not only your honor the 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 statements of uh, Mr. Carrier with regard to his walking into a room of individuals and indicating that he he was willing to pay for the for the uh, um, for the murder of his uh, uh, his ex-wife. You, I mean, all of these statements lead to um, this facts and circumstances surrounding how Mr. Stewart became involved in this, uh, in this joint, joint venture. And but they're not, they're not statements in Ferguson's the joint venture. They may be descriptions of, you know, by non-joint venturers. When you just say facts and circumstances. Well, Your Honor, I would say that the statements that are made by, by Mr. Carrier are certainly um, potentially in furtherance of that effort. Um, and it, it, statements as to the, whom? The, the first, the, the ones to Brayall. To, to Brault and to Berryman initially. Um, and okay, those, all right, I give you those, but go on to the others. Well, I would say with regard to Finney, I would suggest that that is also in furtherance of, of, the, uh, of the commission of this crime. Mr. Finney indicates that he's in Florida to, to, to act as an alibi witness, I mean, basically, and that, that, that watch the news tonight, see what's going to happen, because it's going to happen tonight. He's, he's there for one purpose, and that's to provide Carrier with the, with the but alibi that he was with him. What is he's in a joint venture with the defendant? Well, and, and what I'm saying is, is that this all leads to that, um, Justice Cowan, in, in as much as when you, when you then examine the, the, the Grabowski statements, when you examine the, the statements of Grabowski to Mello, when you examine the statements of, of But our law is that you Stewart have to have proof of a joint venture without the statements. I, I'm isn't, sorry? Isn't, isn't our law, though, that you have to have proof of a joint venture without the statements? Yes. Because it's the independent evidence of the joint venture that makes the statements admissible. And all and you I, tell me is statement, statement, statement. And, and, with, and, and the admissions of the defendant himself to both Mr. Um, uh, the, his, uh, I apologize for the name, the, the, his former boss. Uh, Tracy. Who, sorry? Tracy. Yes, uh, Your Honor. To, uh, his statements to Tracy and his statements to Timothy Blanchett uh, are enough at that point to establish, you know, that there was a, a, a joint venture between, um, between Grabowski and Stewart at right. that point. Now, 
the, the other evidence going back to, you know, how this came about uh, was certain, I think it's certainly supportive of, the, of that, where, of that where, theory. Where does, where does Carrier and Grabowski get connected? Well, Grabowski, Grabowski gets connected through, to Carrier through one of those individuals, and I believe it was Berryman. It was either, I believe it was Berryman or it was uh, through. I know they get connected in the questions they, to Hoke. And, 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 well, yes, but they also get connected through, tr through Tracy or Berryman, as I recall, and again, I, I, without specifically it, it, knowing assuming that, that they, there's not that connection. What do we do with the whole, um, uh, that you knew Grabowski through Steve and Stewart and that series of questions that came in? Well, I, I think that, the, I, I don't think that those questions ultimately are, are, are in evidence here. I think the fact of the matter is, is that those, again, based upon the instruction from the judge, that was, you know, that those questions were out. I mean, the effect of that of those instructions by the trial court, by the prosecutor, and by defense counsel, all of whom aptly appropriately um, stated the the uh, um, that questions again are not evidence, and that only answers are, and no comment answers are not, you know, are not. They didn't say that. Well, I Did think they? no comment answers aren't. No, answers. I'm saying you are, but uh, they didn't say that to the jury. No, but no, but that they are nevertheless answers. No, no comment is an answer. So, so. But it's tantamount to no answer. <laughs> I, mean, I, don't, I don't want to leave this at that. I just want to find out. <laughs> Thank you, Chief Justice. <laughs> the, um, the but what's, so I'm, I'm, I'm confused though. Justice Cowan says, what's the independent evidence that you've got a joint venture among all these people? What is the independent evidence? Well, I think it's, I think Justice Botsford is, as was described before, you have almost a daisy chain effect here that, that one link to another and, and another link it's to another rather statements. than. It's all through statements. That's the problem. Well, the, uh, again, you're talking about a situation in which it, you've got a crime that was committed in 1980. You have um, a number of individuals who are unavailable at the time of this trial, certainly. So and we change the rules of no, the I, No, Justice Count, I'm not suggesting that at all. What I am saying to you is that if you wor work backwards, there's a connection between each person, and the line doesn't, I don't believe that the, the line ends. the connection is through statements that are inadmissible until the joint venture is established. Well, I think that the joint venture, again, is established, the, the joint venture that is established between Stewart's statements to Tracy and Stewart's statements to um, his son uh, give us the, the, the joint venture. Once you start moving, going backwards at that point, you, you go to the beginning of where this occurred, where, where this joint venture started, which was back when Carrier walked into that room and offered thousands of dollars to kill his wife, his ex-wife. Thank you, Mr. Shea. Thank you, Your Honors.